Hi. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kat Liu, and I'm the studio coordinator of painting, drawing, and printmaking here at Anderson Ranch Art Center. Thank you for attending our summer lecture series. At this time, I'd like you to ask you to please turn off or silence your cell, cell phones. Tonight, we'll be hearing two 20-minute lectures from our visiting faculty, Gwendolyn Yopolo and Nabil Gonzalez. Following the lectures, there will be a Q&A session with these two incredible artists. Our first speaker tonight is Gwendolyn Yopolo. Gwendolyn transforms perception by creating ceramic objects in multi-sensory food events. She earned an MFA from Penn State, an MA from Columbia, and a BA in sociology from Haverford College. A passionate educator, writer, and research, as well as a maker, Gwendolyn is currently Associate Professor of Ceramics at Kutztown University. Please welcome Gwendolyn Yopolo. Hi everyone, thank you for coming tonight. I'm here teaching a workshop called Form and Metaphor in Pots of Purpose, which focuses on the layers of meaning that we put into our work as makers. Um, and uh, for a long time, my research has been um, concerned with um, ideas about perception, how we understand the world. And so whether it was, um, whether it's been, you know, using a scanning electron microscope to look at some common objects that we are surrounded by in our everyday lives. Does anybody recognize either of these things? No? No guesses? What? Oh, that's a good one, yeah. That's the, on the left is a fly foot, and on the right is a spider toe. And I just love this idea of the infinite complexity of, of small things. Or um, another thing I like to do is to question our uh, ideas about the stability of color by using rare earth oxide colorants in my glazes. And so this is the same piece under two different forms of lighting. Um, or I strive to um, make pots that invite touch with a soft, sensuous surface that looks like it tastes good and confuse our senses a little bit. Or just make forms that resound with a, a sense of silence. Um, and quiet assurance. So my research has led me into the field of multisensory aesthetics, where I can explore how we use our senses beyond the visual and tactile to um, when encountering craft objects and understanding the world. So I had been obsessed with um, scanning electron microscope images of diatoms for a long time before I started to actually use electron microscopes myself to look at um, beach rubble that I had collected. And I started to find my own um, diatoms. I wasn't very good at it yet, so this one's a little blurry. But I was, um, you know, there's layers of metaphor even in using the electron microscope, this idea of, you know, stretching our, our visual perception um, past our physical boundaries to um, understand the world in a new way. Um, but these, uh, cell, these are the cell walls that are left behind by di diatoms, which are unicellular algae creatures. They're made out of silica, which is a nice connection for us ceramic artists. Um, but I was really obsessed with their open, the um, perforation of the um, cell wall and also by the uh, softness of the edges and the kind of look of the water-worn um, the edges. And um, so I'm going to talk first about how form can be influenced by our sense of self or by our sense of emotional reality. And so for me at the time, I was trying to understand how to be an individual that was, you know, at once bounded and, and had structure, but also was responsive to my environment. So how to be at once structured and permeable. And this open work um, was a way for me to understand that. And I was also really interested in the aesthetics of the water-worn or eroded, um, the softness of, of bones, the way that bones are kind of washed away by the waters of our flesh, or the way these um, edges are always soft um, from, from water wearing them away. And I kind of was trying to translate that into my forms. And over time, from beginning imitating these forms to abstracting from them, I developed um, so a series of work that explored um, the uh, open work and also um, just kind of uh, the functionality of that, the, the functionality of, an, of, an, of, a, of a form that at, one, at once holds things but also lets things pass through it was really interesting to me. 
Um, so, and then I started to title them, um, like this one's just called strain. And so I was just focusing on these verbs of, uh, these action verbs of what these things do um, and thinking about how those could be metaphors for how we process our own emotions, how we filter things, what we hold on to, what we let move through us um, and things like that. Um, so, you know, ceramic artists are, are often working with uh, the vessel as a, um, as a way to talk about um, interior and exterior space. And these uh, open work forms, in a way, uh, break down the boundary between interior and exterior um, and um, in a really interesting way. And this, I, I call this series of um, uh, bone bowls because of the way they um, kind of reflect my study of bones. Um, but in these forms, really, the inside and outside surfaces are one thing. They're so unified, you can't really separate um, interior and exterior. <clears throat> um, and this is a really, it's, it's a recurrent form for me. These pieces hold while also releasing. Um, they contain, but they also allow movement. And I feel like they really breathe with that openness. Um, during COVID, uh, it was interesting, uh, the structure of these forms uh, retreated to the inside a little bit with a more strong uh, exterior wall. I thought that was interesting because of the way it was a metaphor for what we were all doing and a little bit of retreating from public life. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not sure where this will go from here, but these were some a series of wall vases I was working on at the, um, at the beginning of the, the COVID experience we were all having. I like the idea that all the actions on the inside of the piece. Um, but I also use these uh, perforated forms uh, in, in other functional ways. This idea of infusing is interesting to me also. It's another case where you're holding something separate. Uh, you're holding the tea leaves separate from the water, but you're also um, permeating the water with the tea leaves. And so I like that kind of paradox of holding, but also um, allowing flow. Um, and th this is a form that uh, we were, I was working on today with the class um, and a tea infuser set. And um, this is a, an iced tea pitcher and set. So I'm kind of questioning, you know, these things that we do in the kitchen to transform our uh, food into something that we can actually metabolize into our, um, into our bodies. And can, this, uh, can these gestures that we do in the kitchen maybe serve as metaphors for the way we process things in the world? It's something that's interesting to me. Diatoms, you know, I've always been interested in um, joining forms together also with my work. And um, these aren't my images, but these are diatoms uh, linking together to form colonies. And so this idea of individuality and um, within a larger community is um, something that's interesting, interesting to me also. And um, so I've worked with these kind of um, composite forms a lot in my uh, work with ceramics, um, just joining together. And I, for me, it's always been about kind of individual, individuality and relationship. Uh, when you join parts together. Um, so next, the next thing I'm going to talk about is uh, a sense of how a sense of place can, has affected color in my work. And so this is uh, when I lived in Montana for um, a few years, I really developed this um, color palette with the rare earth oxides. And so the, these four mugs, you can see the, the line through them. Um, and that's two different forms of lighting. So the yellow mug will shift to pink. Um, and the blue um, shifts to lavender, just based on, you know, you can carry it from inside to outside and it will change in your hand as you're walking with it. It's really alluring and I love the way that you can't really um, say this is a blue mug or this is a lavender mug. It's, um, it's really interesting to me. And it also, I have the picture of the sky there because um, in Montana, the sky changing color was really dramatic for me. And these always feel um, very ethereal. So again, same piece in different uh, forms of lighting. And I love this idea that color is not a constant fixed quality, that it actually shifts um, as we do um, in ourselves. And so I worked with this for a long time and um, developed a, um, a body of work, uh, had an exhibition called Shift. And then I started reading a lot about the color, the rare earth oxides, how they're mined and things. It's very politically contentious and environmentally devastating. Some, um, the way they process these things apart from each other is, is um, difficult to do. And um, I didn't like all that was making me uncomfortable. I also don't like pastel colors that much. And I was just like, you know what, I, I just have to, sorry, I, I clicked through that a little fast because I got excited. I just decided to ban them from my process and I, I moved, um, I was like, I'm not gonna use rare earth oxides anymore. I was, I'm a person of principle and I, um, 
I wanted to have an earthier color palette, and so I looked around me. I was in North Carolina then, and um, and um, so I made a new set of glazes. I was working with, uh, you know, more down to earth colors. Um, I changed my firing temperature. I moved from cone 10 to cone six. Um, and so I worked with this for quite a while. It took me a year to reformulate everything. And I worked with it for a couple years. During those couple years, I moved another two times or so. Um, my parents both passed away and suddenly the work was feeling really dreary to me. It was interesting how you know these experiences and the transformations in my life affected my sense of color. So I decided to reformulate again and I went through a whole other um, body of research, um, came up with a more vibrant palette. So here's a summary of ethereal to earthy and then to the new palette. Um, this is kind of what it was looking like for a while. Um, so some rare earths crept back in, I admit it. It was hard to let them go completely. But I kept playing with things like, uh, you know, can I get a more of a sense of depth if I change my clay body to a darker clay body? And so this is the same clay glazes on a chocolate colored porcelain. And here uh, you can see the dark porcelain and the light porcelain next to each other with the same glazes. Um, uh, and I also played with, these are the rare earth oxides, same pieces, three different forms of lighting. So you can kind of see some of the range of how they shift. And I was making my own colored grog, and um, I like the visual texture of these, um, how, um, you know, I, I just don't think of color as a really um, solitary, you know, it's not so graphic all the time. So these were a way of um, doing that. Um, and I would polish these really smooth. Here's um, one mug and you can see how it, the um, grog I was making itself was also shifting color. So, and then here you can see the neodymium uh, grog is the blue to purple as it shifts. There it's uh, circled for you. So, um, so that's another thing I like to do. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about um, the sense of time. Uh, wait, I wanna go back. Okay, sense of time and how that affects the things that we, uh, the forms and functions that we decide to work with. So here, you know, you can surround yourself with antiques or else you can, you know, this is like a breakfast scene with that egg, I love the egg and the toast rack in the center with the jam bowl at the top of it. Um, and then here on the other side is like a modernist cuisine version of Eggs Benedict. You know, this idea that every choice we make is, you know, it, it makes us, uh, align ourselves with the past or makes us feel like cutting heads, you know, we're people of the future. And um, this is actually a, um, a company who, um, their vision for the future is that, uh, you know, in a few years, everyone will have a 3D printer that prints food out in your kitchen, you know, just like you have a microwave oven now. And I don't have a microwave. Does anyone else not have a microwave? <laughs> So, and then I don't know if you want to end up eating an, anything that can pass through a syringe or not, but uh, so I'm wondering like when I'm choosing function, the function of things to make, can I, this was, okay, it was a few years ago, you know, you can probably tell about when this was, this is like a hardware store near me that used to always put up funny signs, but um, so I was like, well, can I like influence people through the forms I make to uh, process their own food, you know, and can I take this ancient form, it's like a form that's, um, you know, manual processing of, of food stuff and, and, and also, talk about metaphors, and so this is called, you know, these are called grind, these are mortars and pestles, and can you talk about how we transform thoughts, um, again, by referring to these functions of things? Um, you know, there's, there's a, a citrus reamer there. Um, and then, you know, you have to think about uh, what forms are obsolete, and what forms can we uh, revive and um, have people actually use again? These um, juicers pose really interesting design challenges, so this one has, is sitting on a a pouring bowl that's really nice to um, just drink right out of after you juice. Um, so those are some kitchen items, just some other kitchen items. I really enjoy making utensils and spoons are just such a maternal and soft form. Um, so they come into my work a lot. This is a little salt cellar. Um, and pitchers. Um, pitchers can be really... Um, Figurative, um, and then I like to have lidded pictures also, so you, you know you can just put your thing in the fridge after you serve it, and um, you don't have to do as many dishes that way. Um, so yeah, and then these are just some other uh, 
fun things. This is like a pick set with for olives or something, a cheese knife, and um, these are all rare earth oxides, so I have one picture of the shifting colors there. Um, these are uh, rare earth oxides in the clay body. Okay, so it's just some other um, nesting pouring bowls and some fermentation crocks. So kind of thinking about a sense of time there, and then um, also thinking about how ceramics really can convey a sense of movement. Um, this is a, a, a collaboration with a chef who um, we were con um, discussing kind of a form that, that he wanted to, he wanted to work with plates that followed this idea of a cascade. And so I made these plates that kind of spiraled. The, the spiral's pretty soft in there, but this is from our tasting dinner event that we had. But this stayed with me, this idea of the spiral, and I kept working with that. Um, these are little press molded dishes. Um, and the spiral kept growing and, um, and, and invigorating the form more and more. And I kept trying to think about how to, um, you know, get that kind of dynamic feeling of the spiral. The spiral is such an ancient symbol of transformation. This is the same um, spiral dish, but as a cup and saucer. Um, and then, um, so these uh, kind of, the spiral ended up exploding the form a little bit into these. These are involution dishes, I call them, just as a nod to how uh, introspection can cause transformation of our um, inner lives a little bit. And the spiral has just taken over the form here. I don't know where these will go, but um, I kind of took it to an extreme here in this pinwheel bowl where the function becomes a little bit obliterated by the, <laughs> the movement of the piece. So that's just thinking about how form can convey movement a little bit. Um, Thinking about a sense of community and how we eat. These are pieces uh, about uh, how we eat. Uh, oh, sorry, this is actually um, inspirational um, images. Um, this is a Persian miniature painting. People sharing a meal, uh, a meal in Mali. And so um, I wanted to make some pieces about that where you could all like eat out one big ice cream sundae out of one bowl or share a um, big pot of soup together. I wanted to talk about how uh, relationships, you know, and here's um, just, uh, you know, where the dishes disappear all together and it's just one big uh, experience. So I'm gonna flip through these kind of fast in the interest of time, but this um, is a series about, eat, uh, they're called Eat for Two, and this is just about what happens when you share a meal with someone else in that moment of kind of uh, shared memory that you create. And I was just playing with um, ideas of how to connect the service uh, here, the connect the, um, the dishes, and then these are called tea for two, and it's the same idea, just um, embodying that moment of shared connection that you can have with somebody else. Um, and um, then this was a, a conflict resolution piece I developed, um, which I can tell you about uh, uh, if you're interested in it. This uh, I made, I knit the placemat, and I knit this table runner, and it was designed to bring two people of opposing views together for. Um, a cup of tea and a structured dialogue. And um, so the table runner actually ended in this kind of breastplate and napkin type of thing. And um, the idea was you kind of had to recognize the other person's humanity when you, and this was for um, a specific political event that was happening at the time um, in North Carolina when I was there and they were um, passing the traditional marriage amendment like in 2012 or something like really late. Um, but I never got anybody to do this of either side. <laughs> Nobody wanted to do this. <laughs> um, then I started thinking about feeding, like why do we not feed each other more often? Why are we always feeding ourselves all the time? And so these are some medical ceramics. Um, um, these are infant feeding bottles, ancient European uh, infant feeding bottles. And of course, you know, there's ritual examples of where we feed other people. Um, but I wanted to make some forms for that. So I made some feet, I started off with feeding spoons. And this grew into, um, this is some people trying it out with some beer. <laughs> um, this grew into like a whole service set of, these are for soup and a place setting. And then I started cooking the meals for people and I would invite them to sit and I would just do two people at a time. They would feed each other and then write about it for me afterwards. These um, two people didn't know each other at all. And um, the, uh, it was really interesting. They had to work harder to get this kind of communication going. Um, and she afterwards said this was kind of like when you share a traumatic experience with somebody, your, your normal boundaries are crossed, uh, you know, and um, 
And uh, he afterwards said that was like trying to feed a baby bird or rabbit that was dying. You know, it was like really hard for him to try to empathize with the other uh, in this. But these uh, feeding experiences were really interesting for me. I explored this in many contexts. Um, this was at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. I had a, a show there where we walked around the, and um, we had to sterilize the spoons in between people uh, at this event because it was a group thing. And we were doing that with a hot water bath. And so when the spoons came out of the hot water bath, they were actually warm. And it was so intense because the, the spoons really became an extension of, of the, the body in that. Um, this is another setting um, at Alberta College of Art and Design. And then I also did this at Unseca once. I just like cooked um, some um, in the back room of the conference center and had people just walking by, invited them to feed each other. It's really interesting to me um, how uncomfortable of a process it can be for people to sit down and open themselves to be vulnerable to being fed. It can also be hard to empathize with the other person about how to feed them. Um, but anyway, so that's um, that body of work. And then the, uh, currently I'm just working on uh, glaze research. I, I've, I'm working on um, trying to bring together scientific methodologies with a uh, more creative approach to uh, raw materials exploration. And so I'm working on a, a book project um, integrating some creative ways to blend colors and, surf and create new surfaces for people's work. And so these are um, some intersecting circle tests that I developed um, and which are blends of, of glazes. Um, and here's some color wheel tests. And um, we'll be doing some things this week uh, and next week with color blending. And I'm also using the scanning electron microscope at Kutztown University to research uh, crystallization formation in my glazes, um, different firing cycles, and how they affect the crystal growth. And I just think these images are really beautiful. They're like their own little landscapes. Um, and so this is. Uh, Probably my next few years of research is going to be uh, using the electron microscope that way. So thank you so much for listening. Sorry, um, that went a little long. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Gwendolyn. Um, our second speaker today is Nabil Gonzalez. Um, Nabil uses various printmaking techniques as a form of representing erasure and loss of identity through matrix repetition. She's a professor at the University of Texas, El Paso, and she received her MFA in printmaking from the Rhode Island School of Design. Please welcome Nabil Gonzalez. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Um, let's see. Do I start this? Ooh. Hey. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to start my, my presentation with this image of my hometown, El Paso, Texas, just to give everyone um, perspective of how close the border is to, to my town. So right here, you could see how El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, Mexico are just basically divided by, by the river. You can cross the bridge, um, this bridge right here. Um, within five minutes, you're in Mexico. You can walk to Mexico and come back within one day. My work deals a lot with um, social and political issues around the border areas of, you know, between Mexico and, and the U.S. So um, I wanted to start with this so that you have an idea of how close we are to that border and how close we are to, to those political issues and how it also affects us, not only you know, just Mexico, but it's, they're, they're normally um, known as sister cities because whatever happens in one side affects the other side. So <clears throat> I'm gonna be starting with, with my newest work and this is a series of eight, um, mixed media works on paper. And these were inspired by, by the events of 2021 when the Haitian president was killed and a lot of the Haitian people escaped you know, their country and, and you know, trying to find, find 
a bitter life and escape violence and find refuge here in the United States. So they traveled all the way from Haiti. Um, they walked and they crossed you know, Latin America to get to Mexico and eventually get to the border. Once they got to the border, obviously, you know, their, their entry to, to the United States was denied. And I don't know if you guys are familiar, you know, with, with those events or if you keep up with the news, but it was a terrible event. Um, people were, people were whipped and they were just, it, it was a lot of violence from the border patrol agents towards, towards the Haitians and just the way that, you know, they, they found refuge under a bridge just waiting to, to hear from the, from the U.S. government, seeing if they could, you know, at least present a case and be granted, you know, entry to, to the United States. They suffered hunger, they suffered, you know, whether they were sick. So, um, in this, in these works, you you can see that the most prominent imagery is the agents. Um, I I know it's a little hard to see, but um, you could see some black figures against the black backgrounds, and often, very often in my work, you will find a lot of imagery hidden within layers. My work, um, it. It, it involves a lot of layering. So you could see the very, very noisy background. Um, and to me, it also acts like a way of how memory works, how sometimes, you know, when you go through a very traumatic, traumatic event, we tend to fragment our memories. We tend to suppress those memories and try to forget them. Sometimes, you know, it does work. Sometimes those memories will linger there forever. Um, <clears throat> And then you will also find these phrases, and these phrases were taken from different interviews with um, the, the Haitian immigrants. And you know, once you read them, you could see that you know they're they're just seeking very basic, you know, survival things. Um, you know, we were not we were not wanted. We suffered a lot to get here. I just want to work, find a consistent job, and find stability. The actions of these office Officers are disgraceful and show an indifference to, to the ooh, I can't, humanity of migrants. I don't do. I didn't do anything because I was scared. So, to me, hearing these phrases, they they kind of stay with me, and they show the humanity of these people and how very often um, our our government agencies remove their real identity and. You know, they be just they just they just become numbers and statistics. So they they leave their country so as not to die victims of violence from the gangs and the drug trade. They are trying to escape the most widespread form of violence that hunts them daily, which is the lack of work and economic means to secure the most basic necessities for human survival. And if you think about that, um, I feel like we are very lucky to be in this country because we've never been through through those traumatic, you know, events. So this is the other half of that series of eight, and <clears throat> again, uh, the the main image of the of the agents. I, I guess I'm going to talk a little bit about what's uh, you know my process. So the back background is just acrylic paint painting directly onto the paper. Uh, the images of the agents, those are screen monotypes, so drawing onto a screen, transferring into onto the paper. Um, to me, the, that, that process of the printmaking process, transferring from a matrix to paper, also refers to the idea of memory. Um, those of you that are familiar with print um, might know that sometimes when you transfer from a, from a matrix to paper, you do lose some information or the result is not what you were expecting. So that's why I, I really love using printmaking into, you know, incorporating it into my work because I do lose some of that information or I lose the control of, of my imagery of that end image. So. <clears throat> Also, um, you could see that the, the images of the migrants, um, they are also black against black, so they're very hard to see. Um, a lot of times with my work, it's also very hard to photograph because it's so multi-layered, and I use very dark colors, a very dark palette, so it's, 
mostly you get to experience it, um, you know, standing right in front of it, um, usually getting very close to it. Um, I tend to hide um, text or imagery, so it's, it, it really does take you, you know, standing like right this close to it to find those things and just, you know, spending time with it. So annually, half a million migrants from Latin America travel north in hopes of reaching the U.S.-Mexico border. This image um, inspired the next piece that, that I'm about to show. Um, and the images that you will see, my reference images that you will see in my presentations, um, these images, I, I take them from Google. I usually, you know, Google immigration in 2001, and the image that pops up the most to me, that's the one that I grab and that I use as inspiration for my work. So this piece right here, this is a five panel piece and um, it's about six feet tall by about 190 inches wide. So it's, it's pretty big and again, it's, it's very, it has a lot of layering happening. Um, it's monotype with relief printing. And if you could see down here, um, this bottom part was inspired by the caravans of people traveling from Latin America to reach the Mexican border. How we see, you know, it's this huge crowd of people just walking. So I wanted to reference that with, with this print and also to, to kind of show how, you know, it's really a big number. It's a lot of people coming here. Um, you know, sometimes I feel like when, when we listen to, to the news or we're reading an article and we see a number, it doesn't really mean anything. We're not able to imagine how big it is. So in my work, you will see a lot of that repetition. And to me, it's very important because I feel like I'm, you know, acknowledging every single person that's going through, through you know, these, these events and the violence and just trying to, to have a better life. So this piece is, is is based on the first five kids that died in, in the custody of, of the US um, Border Patrol agencies. Um, <clears throat> as you saw in the previous image, um, kids were separated from their families and they were put into basically cages. Um, to me, this is not humane at all. You know, it references animals. So I don't think any human should be treated in you know, that way. So. Um, the title of the piece is Journey, and then you will see the names of the, these five kids. Felipe um, was traveling with his fa father and ended up in a holding cell in Alamogordo, New Mexico on Christmas Eve after days of being shuttled from one border patrol facility to another. Felipe was diagnosed with flu and died alone in a cell. Felipe was eight years old. Jacqueline survived the 2,000 mile journey from northern Guatemala before being detained and separated from her family. Died while, in, while held in a custody cell, Jacqueline was seven years old. Juan just wanted to earn $13 for his family to buy corn and salt. Died while being detained, Juan was 16 years old. A known two-year-old Guatemalan boy traveling alone died while being held in a cage, was not able to speak due to his trauma. He was two years old. Carlos, diagnosed with flu, found dead on the floor. The next morning, died alone. Carlos was 16 years old. And this information that I just read is actually um, you know, hidden within the multi-layers here um, on the top part of, of the prints. And also you could see um, these, I kind of call them like doodles, but they reference, you know, the maps and how the journey that, that they take from leaving, you know, their, their, their countries. And, ooh, this is just a close-up of, of that piece. Um, so the bottom part, like I said, is this is relief. So basically I created a stamp of the shape of a person. I, I remove faces from, from my work, again, just because I don't think it's fair just to, you know, showcase one person when it's this really big number of people coming here. And <clears throat> this bottom part was, um, I think, 
when we think about the the big number of people coming here, not a lot of them, you know, they don't make it all the way to border. Some of them die, um, you know, during their journey, or they get kidnapped, um, they disappear. So. With, with this technique down here, I, I basically started by really inking heavily my, my linoleum cut and I just treated it like a stamp and just with the pressure of my hand, pressing it down on the paper until the, the figure disappeared and then re-inking it. So again, to show that number of people actually you know, disappearing and their families never hearing you know, what happened to them or not being able to, to bury their, their bodies to, to mourn you know, their loss. So this next piece, um, it's inspired by past, present, and future events. And to sort of um, reference how what happens in the past is still happening, you know, in, in the present time. Um, I have a combination of images. So this image down here is of workers that, that would cross the bridge, you know, um, during the 1920s, 1930s, and how they used to get sprayed with would lie to kill any bugs that you know agents thought they were bringing over. So they would actually strip down on you know on the bridge and they would get sprayed. After that, they would be able to put on back you know their clothes and you know continue their journey on to to their their workplace. And up here you could see images of of those migrants again in their journey trying to to reach the border. Um, <clears throat> Also, I have images of, of lynchings that used to happen very, um, they were very prominent in Texas, Arizona, and California. Um, Mexican people used to get hanged because um, of the culture or the language. Um, American people used to think, you know, that's witchcraft. So, so the lynchings were actually kind of like this event in the town where the whole town would get invited just to watch this horrible event happening. And, you know, again, it's that's very inhumane. And it sort of feels like, you know, those things are still happening just in modern, you know, times. They risk assault, torture, kidnapping, sexual abuse, human trafficking, and death in the hopes of making it to and across the border into the United States. So here's um, another image that, that has inspired my work and also inspired the, the next pieces that I'm about to show. So this is one of the caravans that, that um, started their journey in 2018 from Latin America, again, to make it to, to the Mexican border and then to, to the border of Mexico and the U.S. And as you can see with my work as well, I work for, for, with a very dark color palette or colors that really reference the, the landscape. Um, again, the, these migrants, whenever they cross the border, they have to walk for days in the desert. So that's where, where the very earthy colors come from. And again, the figure is very prominent in my work and it's that, that aspect of you know, repetition really not having a face to, again, show the large number. And to, to me, it feels also, you know, I am remembering this person. This person is important. This person has an identity. This person has a family. Maybe they're a mom, a dad, sibling, you know. So, so to me, it's important to, to whenever I'm working on, with, with my pieces, every single figure that I make is very important to me. So this piece was particularly inspired by the previous image of the caravan. Um, again, trying to document all of those faces that you previously saw into the background of, of this piece. And with this piece, you will see three words. You will see immigrant, Mexican, and illegal. Those three words are, you know, they're very common in, in the border when, whenever people are referring to immigrants. They use these words as a way of, you know, offending other people. And even, you know, the word Mexican, 
I'm Mexican, that's my nationality. And people use it as a way to offend another human being. But in reality, you know, it's not really that. And a lot of the immigrants are not really Mexican. They're Guatemalan, they're from Honduras, El Salvador, they're from other places. So, you know, it kind of, they kind of generalize, um, you know, the groups of people. And this is just a shot um, of my latest um, solo show. And the way that I show my work is very important. I really like to consider the surroundings of the pieces. Um, <clears throat> I really hate when I have just a white cube. I feel like it doesn't really immerse my viewers into the real experience and you know the work that's being presented. So I had the opportunity to show this piece in, in a basement with a very low ceiling. It, it's kind of dark, so you know, whenever you walk in there, it kind of creates this, this really weird and heavy um, you know, vibe. Um, and you know, just to sit in front of the piece and look at all of those faces looking back at you, I feel like it really makes you think about you know, what's being presented. This is um, an image of the first Mexican woman being hung in California. And she was accused of being a witch because she was celebrating her culture which inspired this piece right here. This is a charcoal drawing. Um, <clears throat> and again, the background references the crowd of people that would come out to, the, to, to these um, events. This right here, um, so with my work, I don't just like to you know, create works on paper, but I like to work with artist books because it's a way of documenting what's happening in the world during my current time in this world. So <clears throat> I, whenever I create a new body of work, I usually also create books that you know, get, get collected by, by universities, which to me, you know, it's, it's an amazing thing because it goes into an archive that you know, generations to come will be able to come back and, and look at these, these books. And the title of this book is, Who Are You? And this question came to me because whenever immigrants get, you know, um, <clears throat> they get brought to, to the detention centers, officers never ask them, who are you? They don't care about their names. Um, they just become a number. And whenever they refer to an inmate, they refer to that person by a number, never by their name or their last name. It doesn't matter who they were or who their family is. So again, in the book you will find, um, these are just some, some of the pages. Um, <clears throat> I use a lot of washes with my work because again, it references that idea of memory and fragmentation of memory. Um, <clears throat> also, you will, ooh, I flipped. You will see some sort of like ghost-like images in hidden within, within those backgrounds to, again, show that people die and people disappear in the journey. With my books, um, they're also very interactive. The back side of this book um, has, it's completely filled with, with charcoal drawings of, of the faces that you previously saw on the other pieces. And I'm really interested um, of how people interact with the book and touching it and how, you know, within time, those charcoal drawings are gonna start disappearing from the handling um, <clears throat> of the book. And also the, the box that holds this book is filled with sand taken from the border. So whenever you take this book out of, out of that box, you do get some sand spilling on yourself or the surface where you hold the, the book. So it's you know, kind of creating cry, this experience that you cannot escape you know, what this book is really talking about because it becomes part of you. And in a way, the, the viewer is also kind of you know, abusing that book because it's gonna lose information over time. And that is my work. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Nabil. Um, so now we'll have our Q&A session with Nabil and Gwendolyn. Um, if you have a question, raise your hand and our wonderful painting, drawing, and printmaking intern, Yari, will hand you the mic. Uh, for Gwendolyn, have you have you ever looked at one of your uh, glazes under the microscope? Yes, um, the last four images were of my glazes, oh. the um, crystal uh, growth. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm, I'm studying currently. Uh, with the, I'm working collaborating with a geologist that could stand to understand. Uh, yeah, the the crystallization process. <laughs> Thank you both for such wonderful presentations. My question is for Nabil. Um, I wonder if you do uh, a lot of research um, that informs your work, or if it's more just like your lived experience of um, being a resident of El Paso and like experiencing the media that we're bombarded with every day. I, I, do, I do do a lot of research. Um, not only looking for images that inspire my work, but I read a lot of articles and I watch a lot of interviews because I think it's it's important to to really understand the the you know topics that that I am talking about. So my work really does start with all of that research, and after all of that research comes the creative part of it. Yes, I also want to say thank you both for your presentations and for sharing so much of yourselves um, in your presentations and in your work. My question is for Gwendolyn, and I'm wondering if you have ever been one of the two, have you, if you eat from your shared bowls and what that experience is like for, me, for you. There's no way I'm going to do that, no. <laughs> I'm always the one cooking and serving and studying it. My question's for Nabil, and I was just wondering, um, what's your process for doing the washes um, near the end where you were showing, and like, what is it made out of, too? I, my process comes from a monotype process. Um, I basically have a plexiglass that's really big, and I create washes with printmaking ink, and I basically just kind of go on the plate. I don't really have a plan. I just you know, start painting. Um, I it, It's a lot, it's very messy, it's very wet, a lot of water. So that's why they end up looking sort of like watercolor washes, but it's also that transfer from the plate to the paper and losing some of that information and not really knowing what it's gonna end up looking like. And it's a lot of going back and forth and actually just spraying water directly on the paper and removing information, adding more, so, so. It's a lot of back and forth, but it's it's monotype based, basically. It's so cool, it's so beautiful. Thank you. Hi, this question is for both of you. Uh, you both use color in a very distinct way, Gwendolyn being very colorful and bright and, and then Bill being very dark. Can each of you speak to the, the reasoning and or the sort of process behind why you choose those? Um, when I think about my work and the idea of memory, it always comes to me in black and white. Um, I really find it hard to incorporate color. Um, as you saw, blue was one of those colors, and the reason I work with blue is, to me, it, it's kind of sad, a sad color. Um, it's very gloomy. And the earth colors, um, I, I work with those colors because I feel like they represent the landscape of El Paso, what is that desert, the desert colors. Um, just incorporating other colors into my work doesn't feel natural. Um, thanks, and I, um, I think I, I, I respond a lot to, I talked about the sense of place and how color, um, I kind of respond to where I'm living at, at a certain time or, kind of um, 
you know, feet, like the undertone of the emotionality and, and how the earth tones came became dreary to me seeming after a little bit. Like, I think there's a certain, um, I don't know if anybody has synesthesia in here, but you know how music can sometimes sound like certain colors or, or taste can evoke, like, evoke certain color, colors to us. Um, so I think there's a certain emotional tone that I'm going for too with the colors I choose. But um, in the rare earth oxides working with them, I just use their flexibility as a component with the work. That shifting of color is really interesting to me. Hi, uh, I had a question for you, Gwendolyn. Uh, am I saying it right, Gwendolyn? Yeah. Um, do all of your like your ceramics, your bowls, and your cups? Do they all serve their function, or um, are they all meant to like be used by people, or are they some of them just meant to be art? Yes, they are all meant to be used. Yeah, I don't, and I I think of them as still sculptural objects though, but um, but they do have, yeah, the function is important to the content of the work. Um, for Nabil, just what, in your perspective, what do you think uh, an artist can do to affect political change? That's a hard question. <laughs> I think we can raise awareness. We have the power to, to bring an audience to a specific place, a gallery. And um, I feel like, you know, once people are in there, we're kind of, you know, exposed to, to, to the issue that's being presented. So I think bringing awareness is a way of helping and, you know, hopefully creating some change. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I have a question for you both, actually, kind of in a little bit different ways, but um, you both speak on vulnerabilities within the human experience in pretty different ways. And I'm wondering how you kind of compartmentalize and separate the observation of being an artist from your daily lives. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's hard. I'm not sure, yeah. I don't know. I don't know how to <laughs> answer that question. Wendelin, can you ask it another way? I've been answer. thinking about it the entire time, like <laughs> okay. how to re-ask it. Um, just like both positive and negative, not necessarily negative, but um, mm -hmm. very different viewpoints on the human experience. Like how do you go about your, your daily lives with all of these heavy and mm -hmm. different thoughts? Like, I think, I guess, I, I mean, I think I experience a lot of um, vulnerability and I'm really aware of interpersonal relationships. I think that's a lot of what my work centers on. And so I think I'm constantly processing what happens in my personal life through the work in a way. And so it's not really, um, it's not really a, a, there's not really a separation there um, for me. It's. Um, but you don't want to participate. <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> There's no follow-up to your question. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think uh, for me, there's no separation. Um, living on the border is something that I hear about it every single day on the news or just conversations with friends, with family. So I feel like it's constantly part of my life. Yeah, it's very it's very hard to to remove myself from from the kind of work that I do. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, thank you for coming. Uh, I have a question for Nabil. Mm -hmm. After all the research and doing your work, and like seeing that people die trying to like be in America, when they're in the United States, how do you cope? Like, what's like, how do you handle 
the fact that someone die or like people still dying trying to like be in the same soil that you are i don't it still causes a lot of anxiety and depression sometimes whenever i'm done with a piece i have to take a break from it because it's just a very heavy topic it's it still affects me and i feel like you know <clears throat> a lot of these people are my people and and i'm just lucky to be here and not, you know, forced to go through that experience, but it still affects me a lot. Thank you. Um, this question is for Nabil. Um, I'm curious if you've had either any aha moments with um, people seeing your work uh, or threatening moments or anything that you were afraid for your life or, you know, had people screaming at you or anything like that. Anything you um, want to share? I've had, um, not that dramatic, but I've had comments from people. I've had work being censored or taken down because people had complained about it. Yeah. Uncomfortable conversations as well. Mm -hmm. Good ones. Good and bad, both, yeah. Mostly good. but. I think it's part of, of the work of being a political artist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you.